Greetings. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about analyzing crime scenes and perpetrators. A lot of times people um, want to want to try to understand what's going on in the head of um, a, a perpetrator or why someone committed a particular crime, especially violent crimes or bizarre crimes. And, and sometimes people say, well, they're just sick in the head. They're, um, you know, suffering from some delusions. They have a mental disorder. They were on drugs uh, or they're just an evil person. They're a bad person, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I mean, those are statements that we hear. But what we want to start to do is look at different theoretical approaches and start applying them. And what I'd like to do in this brief video is talk about the dramaturgical approach, uh, which really was developed by Irving Goffman. This is his book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. Uh, it's a classic. Um, difficult reading. I, I found it kind of difficult. Had to go back a couple times and reread it. And then um, I'll be pulling in some information and ideas uh, on the dramaturgical approach from uh, Harry Cohn's Connections, which um, goes over a bunch of uh, theoretical approaches in, in um, uh, the social sciences, specifically sociology. But I want to focus on analyzing social life, interaction, everyday situations as if it's an ongoing drama or play. And a lot of this is based out of that symbolic interactionist perspective that focuses on everyday uh, interactions, how we develop a sense of ourselves, the roles we play, uh, the expectations, the interactions, how we're able to interact and interpret other uh, people's uh, situations and behaviors, how we make sense of the world and our meaning systems. All that really is in uh, that symbolic interactionist approach and the dramaturgical analysis is part of that. So if we're going to look at a crime scene and or a perpetrator or a group of perpetrators, we might want to look at uh, basically, uh, first, the scripts, the scripts that are enacted uh, regarding a particular crime, uh, specific situations involving that crime, and of course, other scripts surrounding that crime as well. Script really is what it uh, would um, be defined as in a play or a drama, but really the script defines the who, when, where, uh, why, and how. And so we can start trying to answer those questions and you'll see often it will be incomplete. For example, why? That we may not have any idea at all. We have to ask um, you, you know, the uh, actual individual why they engaged in that behavior. A lot of times though, we want to look at the how. And sometimes we can see that in a crime scene. We can ask people how they committed the crime. We can begin to understand a lot more of their uh, motivations. Uh, we also want to look at uh, the identity of um, the perpetrator. And I don't just mean that, you know, it is, you know, whatever, whoever, you know, you know uh, Mr. XYZ. No, what I'm talking about here is looking at how they uh, see themselves, their self-identity. Do they see themselves as a nice, caring person, as a tough person, as a hyper-masculine person, as a nasty, mean person, as someone uh, to be uh, reckoned with, someone who instills fear, or someone who's meek and fearful, and so on. And we also want to look at the settings, the settings uh, that the crimes or the crime takes place. And, and there may be multiple sites or settings, but often we're talking about different settings and different scenes in analyzing life as a social drama or play. But also in crimes, we're looking at the crime scene, but also we're, we're trying to make sense of that setting. What is the meaning uh, behind uh, that particular location or that setting? Does it have any symbolic uh, meaning uh, for uh, the perpetrator and or uh, the victims. And we want to begin to interpret the symbolic nature of the props that might be used. That there may be certain um, clues left at a particular crime scene that gives us some ideas about how the offender thinks. Uh, and, and especially this gets into the ideas of their levels of organization or disorganization in their thought process. Uh, when we look at the scene, is it meticulously clean or uh, is it um, very messy? And, and, you know, did the perpetrator leave uh, his wallet on the table with his identification or something like that? Uh, or fingerprints all over the place or, um, you know, hair samples or so something of that sort. want to look at, you know, how careful. And, and a lot of times we see perpetrators who will be very careful and yet... Uh, they will still, during the, the crime, they'll leave all kinds of uh, clues. 
And so we also want to look at the symbolic nature of, um, of the interactions, um, the, the crime scene uh, situation, and try to look at what was trying to be communicated by um, uh, the perpetrator and, and analyze the perpetrator's role in that crime. What, what were they, you know, how, how were they playing out uh, their particular uh, role in that uh, sit situation? Uh, we might also look at were there particular lines that were uttered during a, a crime. Obviously, there'll be some times where uh, that nothing is said. Other times, certain things are, are, are said. Sometimes, if um, the um, victim's deceased, you know, we may not be able to get that, obviously. Other, other times, we may get a report of what was said, and that sometimes gives us clues about the symbolic nature of the crime, the motivating factors, the thought process, and uh, so on. And we want to look at uh, especially analyzing, uh, and this gets into more of where we have um, some um, ideas about who is committing the particular crime or crimes, is looking at the front stage and their backstage behavior. Front stage behavior basically is the everyday ongoing uh, presentation of self that a person has in the public view. And the backstage is what they do by themselves or around uh, close friends or family, for example, or perhaps during a particular uh, crime uh, scenario. So, so, you know, people present themselves in particular ways, um, and usually trying to follow particular cultural norms and, and be viewed as a, in a positive light. Obviously, you know, um, you know, for example, I went to Starbucks this morning, get a cup of coffee and read a little bit. And, uh, you know, sitting around just kind of observing things going on, you can see that uh, people have very similar exchanges, uh, you know, oh, hello, may I help you? How are you? Uh, you know, things of that nature. Um, you know, people seem to be, uh, you know, smiling. You don't hear people yelling or screaming. Uh, you, you don't hear people cursing. Uh, but you never know that, that, you know, someone who is being very polite and complimenting everyone might go home and yell and scream and be violent with um, their, their family. So there's that front stage behavior and backstage behavior, certain things that people do in public and, and, and semi-private situations and then private situations. Now obviously there's things that uh, you know, everyone does in private that they wouldn't want to do in public or would rarely do in public or would be frowned upon or being seen as socially inappropriate uh, you know, to do in, in, uh, in, in, in public. And also many times we can think about whether there's a rehearsal or rehearsals for the crimes, especially if it's, if it's a, a serial crime. If it's a crime that's been repeated over and over again and we begin to see you know, the signature of the offender, we begin to see a particular mode of uh, operation and a lot of uh, you know, consistency. Uh, and this actually gets into the area when we start you know, looking at different crimes and beginning to think, is it the same perpetrator or group of perpetrators? And we start linking uh, you, you know, crimes uh, together, which is major uh, part of um, you know criminal investigation is, is is trying to see are these crimes you know uh, likely committed by the same uh, group of offenders or the same offender. There may be some slight differences. There may be some slight. There may be many similarities. There may be some changes over time. But a lot of times you're going to see um, in, in almost sort of the, that the person that commits crimes and they're rehearsing each time and maybe they're getting a little bit of better better at it. Certainly I've seen this in uh, sex crimes that I've um, uh, looked into and interviewed uh, perpetrators as well as uh, victims. I've seen a process of um, where often a perpetrator, uh, you know, sets up a, um, a, a person. Uh, a ch for example, in, in, in child sexual abuse cases, the perpetrator often grooms the, the child, a child that they, they know, and, um, and they uh, develop a relationship and, and they introduce um, sexually abusive behavior slowly over a period of time. And, and, and so we, sometimes we see that with um, a variety of, of, of crimes. Uh, is there, um, you know, evidence of offender stigma, you know, and, and, and that's one of the things that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, criminals will talk about how uh, they wore a mask because they want to be identified not only because of getting caught, but because of what they're doing, they were shameful or embarrassed of. And um, uh, other times, uh, you know, when they show their identity, they end up killing the um, uh, vi victim because they don't want to be identified, but they also puts an end to that person's knowledge of um, their shameful behavior or uh, act. Are there audiences uh, that are out there 
for um, the offenders. The offender uh, trying to um, uh, you know gather attention for uh, particular purposes. So we always want to look at that. You know, some offenders don't want any attention. All other offenders do want attention. So you see that in different types of crimes that we've been uh, studying. That you know, sometimes offenders want to bring up um, you, know, you know attention and. Um, uh, and, and sometimes you see that with um, uh, offenders, you know, posting their, their crimes on social media or, um, you know, contacting the police or the uh, media about their crimes. And we look at how they use impression management, not only, um, you know, in their everyday interactions or front stage behavior or their backstage if we have access to some of that, but also we'll see them in the courtroom. Uh, we'll see them in interviews, and, and you know, there's a lot of differences. We'll get interviews maybe from family members and friends and, and, and try to piece together how this person actually behaved. They may behave very differently in uh, different uh, situations or uh, scenarios. And we can ask what are the outcome, what are the, of, the, of, of the criminal behavior, what about the rewards that um, the uh, perpetrator is getting as well as the cost that um, are, are there. And, and we might also think about the time frames that are, are, are used. Sometimes people commit crimes you know, uh, pretty quickly, uh, one after another. Other times they may wait a couple months, maybe they'll wait a couple years, or, or uh, maybe they'll commit crimes and then they may not commit crimes for many, many, many years or, uh, again. So I might want to look at you know, um, those, those situations as well. Uh, but I think really um, also if we have the availability of the emotions that are expressed, that can kind of help us just try to understand the meaning systems of thought uh, that, and feelings that the um, offender has in his or her uh, behavior. You know, are they trying to show dominance and power? Um, you know, are they engaging in, in crimes where they appear fearful and, and submissive in, in, in some ways? So, I mean, we want to look at a host of... Um, of, of those factors as well. But I think an, being able to analyze symbols is very important as well. Um, you, you know, I'll give you an example, and that is a uh, popular store was um, selling um, uh, Nazi memorabilia, and uh, people you know, pointed that out to the store, and, um, and they um, uh, st apologized and stopped doing that, but they, they um, stopped selling some of their uh, you know, Nazi theme oriented um, memorabilia, but they still had other uh, items, but they didn't know uh, that those were, um, you know, also had a symbolic nature related to that type of ideology. And um, people would tell them about that. And, um, you know, I don't know if they removed everything or, or, or not, but it was a um, you know, big controversy a while back. And, and, you know, looking at the symbolic nature of, um, of, of that. And sometimes we see that investigating hate crimes, you know, um, and we're trying to think, is the person doing that, you know, to get attention, to scare someone, an individual, or to scare an entire group? Or, uh, and so again, you know, really, you know, focusing in on the symbolic aspects of, um, you know, materials that we gather at any particular crime scene or interviews with, um, uh, perpetrators or those that know uh, the perpetrators. Uh, you know, certainly I've interviewed um, perpetrators before and, you know, other people would say, well, this was the nicest person in the world. There's no way they could have committed this crime that and so on and so forth. Sometimes getting quite angry with me that I would even, you know, believe that this person, you know, engaged in that criminal activity, uh, which they did. Uh, and, and, you know, people deny and say, oh, no, that can't be or there must be some... Uh, some explanation, you know, and, and then again, my, my response is, well, let's talk about that. Let's get down to that explanation. And, and I've seen before situations where someone engages in some rather bizarre behavior. Um, in, in one case, I remember years and years ago, I worked on, um, I referred him to a, um, uh, a, a neurologist because how things occurred in such a quick time frame uh, that the change of behavior was so rapid, I thought, and, and there weren't stressors or changes in the environment thought something's going on, maybe neurologically. I don't know. I was referring to a neurologist. Neurologist office calls me the, the next week and says, thank you, this is a good call. Referral, you know, the person had a tumor and we can operate on that. And that's probably explaining that, you know, kind of strange behavior. And, and, and so, you know, we don't, we want to rule out things, but we don't want to also get, you know, this kind of narrow focus where we think, you know, one thing leading to another and we start connecting things that may 
uh, not actually be really connected. So we want to be careful of, 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 of that as well. Um, in a sense, I know when I worked in um, uh, different forensic settings, I, I think I was my own biggest critic. You know, I was coming back and analyzing, you know, uh, did I miss something? Uh, did, did I misinterpret something? Do I need to go back and look at this or look at that? Uh, and, and some would say, you know, you really don't have that time when you're trying to, you know, investigate crimes. And that may be the case initially, but certainly go back and revisit. Uh, you know, I'm going back and revisiting crimes that were committed in the 1800s, you know, using, uh, uh, you know, documents to analyze uh, different uh, cases. Uh, and, and, and certainly I'm never going to get, you know, what I would get if I could actually interview, you know, those particular uh, uh, offenders. But I'm trying to piece together different uh, uh, scenarios. But I think the dramaturgical approach is, is just one that really is helpful and, and useful and lets us step back and, and, you know, kind of see the whole crime scenario as an ongoing drama or play and then use some of those uh, terms and ideas and concepts from uh, you know, drama basically to uh, analyze social life. And this wraps up this video. Thank you.